Okay, guys, so we're going back to the Indisputable Truth book series. So just to summarize what we did before, we went over, you know, the ideas we need to consider before beginning, you know, the idea of calling dissonance bias, lack of knowledge and criticism. Then we went through the section of evidence for the existence of a creator, right? We went through the options. There's four options. You're either atheist, you're either a deist, you're either agnostic. And we went through how all those... Um, we went, through, we went through the idea of all those things are, in a sense, flawed. Atheism, agnostic, I, um, some being agnostic, deism, all this stuff. And then we went over the topic of probability versus improbability, that we're going based on probability. And then we talked about the, the proofs of God, right? The evidence for how you know God exists. We went through the first cause argument, intelligent design, fine-tuning argument. Um, and then we went through... Now we're actually up to the section of, of the need for religion. So... Uh, Okay, yeah. I think uh, before going into this topic, um, I kind of mentioned it before, but I think it's good to just to repeat the idea again. Of Now that we understand God exists, how do we know that God didn't just create the world and leave? Meaning, it's called the clockmaker theory. You could make a clock, you know, and um, make it whatever, set the time, put it, okay, I created it, I put it in a room, and I leave. Now the clock will work without me, you know? Might need someone to give it a battery charge, but it will work without me. It doesn't need me involved. So how do you know the same thing with the universe and the world? Maybe God created the universe, you know, and uh, he basically created like a clock. It worked on his own. He made all the rules. He made nature, all that kind of stuff. And then he left, and now he's not involved in the world. And basically, it's a random world that doesn't have God involved with it. How do we know that's not true? So the idea is what? The idea is if we have to understand what infinite means. The word infinite means all-encompassing. Right? So let's, let's answer this question. God is infinite and the universe is finite. How can the infinite and finite coexist? If God is infinite above space, above time, right? Infinite means not bound by space, not bound by time. How can you have something that's finite, that is bound by space and time, coexist with infinite? Infinite should be everything, right? Get that question or no? Make sense? It's a little bit confusing. If God is above space and time, right? How can something exist outside of God that's physical? If God is everything, we say Hashem is everything, right? Ain't no milvado, there's nothing but Hashem. How can you have something called the universe? How can you have material? How can you have atoms? How can you have molecules? How can you have this whole world? That should, doesn't make sense. So the answer is that really infinite is all-encompassing, meaning infinite includes the finite. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. And this will answer the question, how you know God's running the world? If I, I said this before. If I'm, imagine I'm imagining in my mind an orange tree. Or an apple tree. I could in, one second I could think an orange tree, one second an apple tree, one think a, I could uh, a blueberry branch, whatever it is, right? A bush. I could think of anything I want in my mind. Now that thought only exists because I will it to exist, because I'm thinking about it. Once I stop thinking about the thought, it doesn't exist anymore. Now let's put it this way: if I don't exist, then the thought doesn't exist. But I could exist without the thought being there. Right? I don't have to think anything and I still exist. But that thought without me thinking it wouldn't exist. You get the idea? So th same thing with the universe. Think of God. Everything you see in the universe is like, is, 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 when, sorry, when we look at objects, it's separate from us, right? We look at this object, you know, these AirPods, this book, you know, this cup right here. Everything is a separate entity from us. But you have to look at the universe as everything is included within God. Meaning what? Obviously, I'm saying metaphorically, God's not physical, but what's the idea? The idea is what? Think of it as God is, is imagining everything, right? This is a mushal. Don't take it literally. I'm just using it to explain the point. Mushal means parable. So the idea is what? Imagine God is just imagining the universe. He's imagining, you know, this table, this tree, you know, the atoms, the molecules, the Big Bang, right? Now, the universe is only existing because God is thinking about it. God is willing it to exist. As soon as God doesn't will it to exist, there's no universe. So think of it like this. Really, the universe is like, in a sense, not again, don't take it literally, because obviously we, we live in the reality of where there is a universe and you know things do exist. But the idea is, look at it like from this perspective as the universe is basically God's imagination. Is it real? Is it really, is it really finite? No, in a sense. It is, but what do you mean? If I, if I hit my hand against the table, it hurts. Yeah. We live like that. We live in that reality. But really, the universe is, is, is all, in, it's, it, it's including God. It's God's, in a sense, imagination. God is willing it to exist. And therefore, if God doesn't exist, God forbid, the universe doesn't exist. But since, but God could exist with, independently of the universe. The universe doesn't 
need God or not. So that answers the question of how you know God must be involved with the universe. Because if you think of the universe as a separate entity, then you're right. It, but it's impossible for it to be a separate entity because once we prove that God is an infinite being above space and time, infinite is all encompassing, that means it includes the finite. Therefore, the finite is just the willfulness, whatever we call it, of the, of the infinite. The infinite is willing to exist. So therefore, whatever you see in the world, God is willing it to exist. God's allowing that. Oh, how does that, how does that go with the question of free choice? We'll see later on when we talk about the idea of free choice. But it doesn't have to be a contradiction. It's just because just God sees the future and knows what you're going to do. It doesn't take away from the fact they have free will. You still have free will. Whatever, we'll get to that later. But the idea is what? That we, we see from this point that everything in the world has to be because God's willing it. So when Trump, you know, moved his head and the bullet didn't hit him, God was willing that to exist. The guy had free choice to shoot him. But God says, no, I want this guy to exist. Even though people have free choice, sometimes when that has to get, gets in the way of divine intervention, he, God has to, you know, maneuver the thing. But we say everything from the stubbing of somebody's toe against the table to the biggest supernova to a leaf falling. Everything you see in the world is God willing it to exist. And therefore, it's impossible to say that God created the world and left because he can't do that. It's not that he can't do it, he's limited. Meaning it's, 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 it's an illogical thing to say that because infinite is all encompassing. Good, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, fine. If it doesn't make sense, let me know. I could, uh... The book explains it much better. I was just saying it on the top because we have the second edition right here and the second edition, the, this is in the third edition of the book, this whole idea of how you know God is running the world. Fine, so now we know God exists. Now we know God is running the world. Next question you ask is if God's infinite, right? And he doesn't need anything. Why did he create the world? Right? He's perfect. If, if we were before the creation and there was no universe and it was just God, what does it make sense for an infinite being who's perfect, who's not lacking anything? To create a universe or not create a universe? We went through this question. The answer is not create a universe. So if God did create the universe, and not only that, he's involved with the universe, that means there must be a purpose. And, not, and that's where religion comes in. That's where the need, that's, this is what this section is called, moral argument, the need for religion. Meaning that not only did God must have, whatever he did, if he created the world for a purpose, based off the fact that he's running the world and he didn't leave, there must be a purpose for the world. There must be a, you know, you see everything has a purpose. You get, a bee has a purpose. You know, a bee does, you know, uh, you know, produces honey. It pollinates plants. You know, without a bee, the world wouldn't be here, right? We couldn't have survived because they literally pollinate uh, a lot of the agriculture that we eat. Whatever the idea is what, you see everything has a purpose, a chair, a table thing. It must be that the most complex being in the universe, a human, also has a purpose. That's where religion comes in. Religion tries to make the claim, okay, God created the universe, God runs the world, he's involved with it. It must be that God communicated it to mankind, the, the purpose of the world, of what we're doing here. So let's read, let's go, let's read it. Let's read it inside. More argument, the need for religion. Generally speaking, all human beings have an idea of right or wrong. By the way, this is kind of like a, like a, I don't know how we say it in English. In Hebrew, it's derech agav. Like, a, by the way, you know, proof for God. That the fact that there's good and bad must be there's a God. We'll explain. This is one of the proofs people use of there must be a God. Unless someone says there's no good and bad. But we'll see. Generally speaking, all human beings have an idea of right and wrong. But the obvious question is, why is there such a concept of right, good, and wrong, bad? If there's no God, then why does it matter what people choose to do? According to atheists, the world was created through random happenstance. There is no inherent purpose to life. There is no uh, there is no judgment or afterlife. So there is inherently no right and wrong. Therefore, you should be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and no one has a right to stop you. Think of that. If you're an atheist and you think everything is a bunch of atoms and molecules, then there's no good and bad. Is it, do you think there's good and bad if there's if, if, if you don't believe in anything? If you don't believe in God. You don't believe, you just believe we're a bunch of atoms and molecules. Okay, we happen to be, we became conscious over time, right? But we're just a bunch of so, well, who says, can atoms and molecules be good and bad? Who even invented that idea? It's an invention, according to atheists, right? After all, there's no right and wrong, right? But even the most brilliant atheists will agree that morality is a fundamental element of human society. Without laws governing right, uh, right from wrong, humans would no, be no different than, from animals in their behavior. But still, there is no objective reason, objective reason why a person should choose to do what is moral. Moreover, different cultures have different standards of morality for centuries. So right off the bat, you see, if someone's an atheist, and even the biggest atheists admit this, forget society, even if society determines, even if every human being says in the world and, agree, and agrees that killing is bad or this is bad or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If you're an atheist, you automatically lock onto the idea that there's no God, we're a bunch of atoms and molecules, and you could do whatever you want because there's no good or bad. Society wants to say good or bad? Nice. I don't care what society says. 
Great. One day society says this, one day society says something else. It doesn't matter. There's no objective good and bad, really, according to atheists. That's why, by the way, when we go to the section of why people are atheists, this, this is one of the reasons that explains the ideology of why they love atheism. Because basically, there's no good and bad. You can do whatever you want. You could look at this person, you could sleep with that person, you could eat whatever you want, you could say whatever you want. There's no consequence, there's no rules, there's no regulations, nothing happens to you, right? So, now for... Different cultures had different standards of morality. For centuries in India, it was common to burn a widow alive with her dead husband so they could go to heaven together. Do you think this is this is right? Do you think this is moral? What do you guys think? No. Why not? Alive. So what? According to them, that's how they go to heaven. So if everyone has their own standard of morality, this society, that society, what makes them? What makes you more right than them? Why? Why is it wrong? Let them burn their widows alive. You know, the widow, she's screaming, help me, help me, I'm burning, they want to kill me. Right? And you're a British soldier standing there. And they and the, the Indians are like, bro, get the heck off her. We want to burn her alive with her husband. She goes straight to heaven. So is she, what they're doing wrong? To them, no. But to you? Yeah. But why? Maybe the, what they're doing is right. Maybe she's actually going to heaven. And life has value. So what? They, they, what do you mean? That's the ultimate, they believe heaven is the ultimate goal? Die. Okay. But I'm saying, see, we have some, okay, we have a... a well, they according to their religion, only if you're a widow, uh, then you could do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm just saying that there would be really we would really if we had no standard of, of morality, we'd have no reason to say uh, what's it called uh, that, it's wrong, yeah. that it's wrong. If there's no general standard of morality, okay. All right, so we see important we see an important issue. Uh, we're page 19 on the top. Who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong? Society, we see that every society has their own set of, a, a set of standards and morals. The Romans would practice pedophilia. Do you know that? The Romans would basically be, you know, they would get soldiers who were like young or whatever, and they'd rape them basically with older men with younger boys. It's a, it's a known fact. So they would do hit pedophilia. The Hindus would burn widows alive. The Nazis would murder innocent Jews. If you were a Nazi and living in the time of Germany, the more Jews you killed, the bigger, the righteous, the more righteous you are, right? According to them, obviously everybody else thought they were crazy and nuts, but again, according to them, they're right. They're not doing anything wrong. But what makes us say they're, they're right and what's wrong? I understand, okay, human life is valuable, so what? They think for them that the, the Jews were evil, so they need to wipe out all the evil. They, they, they think they were doing a mitzvah, you know? Yeah, or the terrorists, for example, when they blow up people. What? They think they're doing a, They think they're serving God. They think they're doing a good thing when they kill people, right? So... The majority of people who lived in these societies did not even think these actions were immoral. When people would, you know, pres uh, presumably they thought their actions were normal. What makes what makes one society more right than the other? You know, they would in in, in Roman in the Romans they would basically if someone was handicapped, the baby came out of the form, they would basically get the baby, leave it in a forest, and leave, or drop it in a well. Think of that. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong when they did that. That's normal. What do you mean? The baby's messed up. We don't want to like deal with something that's like you know messed up. Throw it in the garbage. That's it. Move on. Let the animals eat it, right? That's how they thought. Now the question is, okay, we're so smart. Two thousand years later, and we think, oh, these people are idiots. What were they doing? But you know what? what if, according to them, they're not wrong. And what stuff we do now, like look what's going on now. You know, with all the you know the liberal culture and whatever. You know, all this stuff. Whatever. I'm not going to say details. But we, we, a lot of people think, oh, it's normal. What's so bad about it? You know. But I'm just saying, everyone has their own standards of morality. Right? So, oh, some suggest that morality should, uh, should be based on the majority of what people believe in. So if everyone says this is bad, everyone says this is good, then we go about, about where everyone says. But then we said, however, not too long ago, in, uh, infanticide, I don't even know how to pronounce this word, infanticide, basically the killing of unwanted newborn infants was quite common, as was the killing of deformed and mentally disabled people, what I just said. The majority of... The majority worldview changes as history shows. Therefore, even if the majority of the world agrees on something, it doesn't make it right or wrong. So what makes something... So if everyone said, guys, killing is bad, everyone said stealing is bad, it doesn't make it right or wrong. Because imagine the majority of society said those things are good. So we're going to say they're right? No. So what makes something right or wrong? There must be something deeper in th than current societal values because they change rapidly from place to place, time to time, back and forth, and back again. Okay. The notion of absolute right and wrong points to an absolute source from which it originated. We call this source God. 
Therefore, if God created the world with right and wrong, then of course he would inform us of these uh, principles so we can live by them. Otherwise, we could be living our entire lives committing immoral actions without even realizing. Basically, if you want to agree there's morality, you have to say there's a God. There's no way around, around it. If there's a God, God created the world, God created the idea of good, God created the idea of bad, no matter what happens in society, God, God is, is infinite. God, God's word stands forever. So if God said killing is bad, killing will always be bad. If God says, uh, you know, committing adultery is bad, it will always be bad, right? 3,300 3, years and today. That's why we say the Torah never changes. The Torah never changes. Just because society changes doesn't mean. If society says something is okay, doesn't mean the Torah agrees to that, right? Doesn't mean God agrees to that. So we see from here what? That you have to have, um, it has to come from a uh, divine being. So some people say, you know what? I know intuitively it's wrong. By the way, even if someone says intuitively, that doesn't mean great. You didn't believe it intuitively, right? But I'll tell you the answer to that. So I heard a rabbi, he basically, uh, some guy said, you know what? Yeah, we don't care about what society says of what's good and bad. We don't care if everyone agrees. It doesn't matter what everyone else says, but intuitively know that killing is wrong or this is bad. So the rabbi said to him, okay, fine. You believe killing is bad? What happens if I gave you a pill that, you know, like, you know, in, in the matrix, like they give you that pill and that pill basically makes you like, you know, not feel, you know, anything bad about beating old ladies and taking their purses on the street and killing them, right? Uh, so if you took that pill, right, would you still kill? The guy's like, um, no, I, I wouldn't kill. But what do you mean? There's, if you don't feel, okay, let's say you don't if feel intuitively what's good and bad, so then it shouldn't be bad. Let's say you took away that feeling of intuitiveness. Would that be bad or good to kill the lady? Would you still, he's asked, would you still kill the old lady and jack her purse, right? And the guy said, well, the guy was a little bit nuts, the one, what I heard in the story. He's like, yeah, I would do it. And everyone thought he was nuts, whatever, and <laughs> everyone stayed away from him. But the idea is, well, most people would say, what? No, you wouldn't do that. But why? You don't feel it. You're taking a pill, right? You don't feel good and bad. So what, what's wrong with it? The idea is, even if you took a pill, and even if you, and you didn't feel anything when you do it, you still know it's, it's wrong, right? So you see here, it has nothing to do with, you know, what society says, it has nothing to do with intuition. It's all based off of what? It has to be based off a of moral arbitrator, which we call God. Okay, what time is it right now? Okay, fine. So now let's let's go, let's finish out what is God. Um, this, okay, so this is where, we're, uh, so we said here that if there's an absolute, we, we admit that there must be a good and bad, right? If we say there's no good and bad, then we're go back to idiot. So if there must be a good and bad, it must be that if a God created the world and is running the world, he must have uh, communicated to mankind what his will is of what good is and what bad is. So this is where religion is necessary. Most major religions claim that God has communicated the moral code that defines right, good, and, and wrong, bad. This moral code is universal for the human species and is absolute, meaning it does not change with time and space. Ulti ultimately, if you believe in good and bad and want to make declare universal morals such as murder is wrong, then you must admit the existence of a super, supernatural moral arbitrator God. Otherwise, there's other, there are no other sources for such morals. Basically, if you if you say you don't believe in good and bad, sorry, if you say you believe in good and bad, that means you have to believe in God. You have to believe in a moral arbitrator God, someone who gave it. There's no way to believe in good and bad without believing in, in God. Right? That's where the atheists are stuck, and they, they, they try figuring out another way of you know figuring out. But whatever excuse they give, whatever reasoning they give, it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't matter because you could always say, well, it doesn't, I don't care at the end of the day what you feel inside or what society says. But yeah, so that's the end of that section. Uh, next time, we're going to continue on the section of what's, what is God and which religion is God given. We're going to go into you know, different religions, go into Christianity, go into Islam, go into you know, Judaism and see how do you know what's, God, what's from God and what's not from God. Thank you for listening.